I'm uh, Paul Brogan, the president of the Boston Foundation and uh, Professor Barry Bluestone's uh, partner in this undertaking of the 21st century uh, American city. Uh, tonight our topic will be urban economic development and we have three outstanding uh, speakers to share their insights uh, with us. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, next week uh, we will be tackling uh, urban education, uh, a hot topic certainly in Boston and in Massachusetts uh, these days. Uh, and the week after that we will uh, be focusing on, uh, on public safety uh, and neighborhoods and uh, we will have the police commissioner of the city of Boston, uh, Ed Davis, joining us that evening, uh, among others, and if any of you were at the class that uh, Commissioner Davis appeared in last year, you know uh, that it will be very, very interesting and, uh, and provocative. Uh, tonight, uh, we tackle urban economic uh, development. Um, we know that uh, American cities are in very, very different states these days in terms of their uh, economic success. Uh, we know that uh, cities cycle in and out of economic success. I think the examples of Boston and Detroit that Barry has continually referred to are very helpful uh, in that sense. Um, one of the difficulties that uh, uh, those trying to build urban economies confront, of course, is that the, uh, the economy is, tends to be regional or metropolitan in nature and not conforming at all uh, to the political boundaries, the political jurisdictions uh, that exist. Uh, and we know uh, that is a particularly acute problem uh, in Boston, where Boston is uh, the smallest uh, center city in both land area and population with respect to its metropolitan area uh, in America. Uh, the city proper has only about 600,000 residents in a metropolitan area of over 4 million. Um, the land area of the Boston is a scant, uh, I think it's uh, 40 some square uh, miles. So the problem of uh, actually coordinating uh, economic development policy in a way that will benefit the city when the economic unit is a metropolitan is a, is a particularly uh, vexing one. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Bob Culver, the head of mass development, uh, is an expert on uh, uh, public policy when it comes to uh, urban economic development, among many other areas of expertise, and uh, I expect that he will uh, set a great context uh, for us. Um, and our subsequent two speakers, uh, while offering what insights they may, are also going to discuss uh, some more specific economic uh, development ventures uh, that they have conceived of and are carrying forward uh, in various parts of the urban economic development uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, and then uh, we'll finish up, I believe, with uh, some closing comments from, uh, from Professor uh, Bluestone. I'm going to introduce uh, all three of our guests uh, at once and invite them to come up uh, serially. First, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Bob Culver, Robert L. Culver, who is the president and CEO, as I said, of Mass Development, the, the state's uh, quasi-public development. Uh, agency. Before joining Mass Development, uh, Bob had a long career in uh, higher education uh, as uh, Vice President for Administration and Finance at Yale, uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at the Cabot Corporation in the private sector, and also uh, as a Senior Vice President and Treasurer of Northeastern <coughs> University. Uh, here, right here, and uh, Bob, uh, as some of you may know, had a great deal to do with the modern success that Northeastern University has enjoyed in terms of its development and evolution as a first grade American uh, research university. He has a bachelor's degree from uh, the State University of New York at Buffalo and master's degrees from both the London School of Economics and the Kennedy School of Government uh, at uh, Harvard. And he is deeply involved in many civic uh, and charitable uh, activities. Second, we're going to hear from Tim uh, Ferguson, who is the founder, chair, and managing partner of a relatively young uh, uh, venture uh, uh, called Next Street Financial, which you will describe, but uh, briefly it's an effort to create uh, a merchant bank focusing on inner city economic development and providing technical uh, advisory and financial services to growing inner city uh, businesses. 
uh, he is pursuing this uh, uh, venture out of his great commitment uh, to the inner city following an extraordinary career as an investment banker uh, in, a, in a number of locations, but uh, his last assignment was uh, in the 90s was uh, the top uh, uh, investment person at Putnam, Putnam Investments uh, here in uh, Boston. And uh, like Bob, Tim is deeply involved in uh, many uh, civic and philanthropic ventures. Uh, 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 Actually, Tim is going to go third. I have that wrong. Um, uh, I've got my cheat sheets out of order here. We're going to hear second from Desh Deshpande, uh, who um, uh, is a native of India, who emigrated to first Canada in the United States. Uh, as a young adult, uh, he is a renowned uh, serial entrepreneur who has founded and grown many uh, technology and internet related uh, companies in his career, uh, probably most notably uh, Sycamore uh, Networks. Um, he is a member of the uh, MIT uh, Corporation um, and uh, very involved with MIT in a variety of ways, including in the venture that he will uh, talk about to take advantage of the uh, commercial potential of the innovations coming out of universities like uh, MIT. He and his wife, Jayshree, are also extraordinary and uniquely creative uh, philanthropists. Um, and, uh, they are devoting much of their lives to philanthropy these days, both in their home <coughs> province of Karnataka in India, where they have uh, 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 been working to uh, strengthen and develop a remarkable network of NGOs in that part of uh, southern India uh, and uh, here in the United States with uh, their work with MIT uh, and others. So first we'll hear from uh, uh, Bob Culver of Mass Development, uh, second uh, Desh Deshpande, and we'll wind up with Tim Ferguson and as always we'll devote uh, most of our second hour uh, to an open discussion. Bob? I'm just curious, how many folks were here last year at this time? When, ah, this is, well, I, I, am, <laughs> I am back to uh, begin with a series of slides, which I'm sorry to say. Let's see if I can make this happen. By, how do I point to the little blue dot? Uh, press it up. I have become no better at using this than I was. <laughs> Um, what I want to do is I, I'd like to, in, in this role, my role for those of you who don't know, last year was teaching with Michael Dukakis at this time, and we had the audacity to try to uh, give advice to whomever the new president might be, and, and it got to be a pretty harrowing experience, I think, in this classroom in the evenings. I'm afraid that the experience, harrowing in, in that the economy was really in tough shape and the world was going to some pretty crazy places. Um, tonight, I, I want to set the stage sort of in terms of the economics that anyone trying to deal with a state or a city or town are looking at just very briefly. And then I'd like to take you with me sort of on a trip through Massachusetts through the eyes of, of me and the Massachusetts Development Finance Agency and what we have been doing with a variety of, of, of cities and towns around the Commonwealth. And then when we go into the question and answer period, you can come at me with the question of why from a million different directions and we can deal with issues of investing in or not investing in businesses in cities and towns and taking risks on new technologies. And for those of you who have been following the Globe articles on Evergreen Solar, we can even talk about that if you'd like to. But let me. Let me get to um, okay. um, <laughs> not much has changed since the last time I taught here, uh, other than the fact that uh, unemployment, as we expected, and I was the curmudgeonly old CFO saying this to folks here, that we would probably hit 10 percent or better, and that that is happening. And this is just to give you a sense of what anybody sitting in the chair of either the governor or the mayor or city councilors, uh, not only in this state, but throughout the United States are looking at. So we've got national unemployment rates near 10% and a lot higher in many of the cities and towns in the Commonwealth. Personal savings rates going to 4%, that means that we are no longer consuming, we are saving, and that's gone from about, uh, you know, it's, it's up about uh, 
uh, from where it was in terms of non-saving, negative savings, to increase savings about the 10 percentage point swing. We've got national debt soaring to about $12 trillion. We've got median home prices dropping uh, at this point in time after a substantial increase. Manufacturing employment steadily falls, despite what Barry may have said about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Overall, we've got, we've got a real problem. Um, and retail stays slow, which is back to this notion that we're not seeing the consumption, therefore we're not seeing a lot of the tax revenue, uh, and, and therefore businesses are slowing down, and therefore when businesses slow down, other things like commercial real estate slow down, and we have this uh, uh, spiral down in terms of the economy as a whole. Uh, personal income uh, has, uh, has stagnated, basically, um, and so therefore we have the issue of national debt increasing, pressures on national budget and taxes as a result of this, personal savings up, pressure on disposable income, therefore, and overall declines in income and, and employment. The bottom line for this quick jaunt through a miserable economy is that what we face on the city or town level is therefore, as many of us know and as we talked about last, uh, last fall, is that with these declines, uh, people have, have said, continue to say, where is it going from? Are we, are we in fact going to have this sort of bounce back up or are we declining to some new low in our economy? And it would appear, it would appear uh, that we're not going to have a bounce back up, but that in fact we're probably looking at somewhere between a 20 and 30 percent decline from where we were two years ago, which means if you thought that your house was worth a million bucks, it's really only going to be worth seven or eight hundred thousand dollars if you were living off, and I'm picking these numbers because they're easy to deal with in my entire mind, and if you were living off a 10 grand, <clears throat> 10 grand a month, you're really only going to be living off a seven grand a month, or maybe even six. And that decline, therefore, in the value of the major asset of, of most people and in their real income, uh, then leads to a spiral for the, the dealing with of urban policy. Uh, in that, you will have a decline in the real property values in cities and towns, which will mean people will seek rebates and or new sales will result in lower tax revenues than, in fact, we had two years ago. And with that occurring, the city or town has the choice before it to either tax you more to make up for that decline to sustain the police and the fire and everything else that, that one has, or in fact there is an absolute reduction in services uh, provided. And as a commonwealth, and as a commonwealth of 351 cities and towns, uh, those are the basic issues that we are confronting at this point in time. And even with the stimulus money, given that uh, the stimulus money has been given out so far programmatically, uh, that is, in the, in the traditional way that the federal government works. So that there's transportation money, there's education money, there's health care money, and the like. It is not necessarily guaranteed, in fact, it's not guaranteed at all, that that will result in the type of job production <clears throat> which will, in some overall way, deal with personal income, deal with disposable, therefore, income and spending, therefore, get the economy going in a way that is quickly noticeable. Um, so that's sort of the situation that we're in. What, what mass development, um, uh, you know, we basic, the, the basic facts, I thought it would be nice to talk about in Massachusetts, a lot of people don't talk about it, is that, uh, as we, you know, we're one of 50 states, we're the sixth oldest state, we've got 6.5 million people and about 7.8 thousand square miles within the Commonwealth. In terms of of the municipalities in Massachusetts. Massachusetts has 351 communities, as I noted, that have their own government and do zoning and permitting on their own. Now understand what that means uniquely for Massachusetts. 351 of anything is a lot. And, and we have we have Ranch Kimball here tonight, who I had the pleasure of serving under at one point in time as the chairman of my board, and was the Secretary of Economic Development. Um, and and um, the issue that that presents for us, and Paul sort of began to allude to this, is we've got 351 cities and towns. It is a model that was designed when people asked me when I just started the shop six years ago, what was the major issue in terms of dealing with urban development and planning in the Commonwealth? And they thought that I was going to say something like infrastructure or education or healthcare. And I said, 
No, it, it, it really is the geopolitical infrastructure. And that is that the thing that has not been looked at, has not been considered, has not even been discussed in about 200 years, and it's a bit more than 200 years old, is the makeup of the Great and General Court that's constituted by representation from 351 entities. In a commonwealth, which the point that I wish to make here is that it isn't very large. We have 70 counties, but we don't believe that they really work well. We would rather distribute a budget of about $28 billion uh, by between 351 entities as opposed to 70 entities. And therefore, uh, the math of that would lead anyone to believe, even if our, our, our good friend, Speaker DeLeo, was, was here, who oftentimes lectures before this class, um, it would be known that if we only were giving out 70 awards for the development of areas which we would call counties as opposed to municipalities, we might be able to provide the same type of services uh, but not have the same strain on the budget. Yes, it would be the case that Harding, Shirley, Ayer, Lemonster, Fitchburg would not all have their, their own school department. They would not all have their own police department or fire department. But being basically contiguous, they might come forward with a regional plan which pro provide for maybe two high schools and maybe a centralized public safety facility and maybe other methods of dealing with health care and the like, which would be very reasonable from a geographic as well as a population perspective in any other state but Massachusetts, where in fact it's very, uh, it's felt that to have these things in your own town, regardless of how small it is and how close it is to another, is very important. And something which we therefore pay for in taxes, and something which also causes us now to have to deal with a reduction of five to seven billion dollars out of this $28 billion budget, which in any way you think about it is just a substantial amount. Let me go through some more of the cities and towns though, because I think you'd like to see them. Um, we, uh, why does mass development exist? <clears throat> As you think about policy, what happened in the, in the early, uh, Early 1990s is that a thing called BRAC came along and, and in the business of dealing with cities and towns, the federal government can sometimes come in upon you with incredible force and really not be seen. And BRAC was the Base Reallocation and Closure Act, which came upon Massachusetts. And most people don't even know that Massachusetts has some substantial military bases uh, uh, in, this, in this great commonwealth, one of which is in Devons, Massachusetts. And in 1992, it was closed. And all of a sudden, lights went out on 2,500 civilian jobs in the, in the Neshoba Valley, which was the major employer. Mass development, quick history came together as the Massachusetts Land Bank and MIFA, the Massachusetts Industrial Financing Agency, and the great general court of this commonwealth, the legislature really did something quite brilliant and efficient. It said, why don't we put the agency that can provide financing, tax exempt financing, for businesses as well as not for profits, together with the Massachusetts Land Bank, whose job it is to deal with basically excess properties that the Commonwealth has to either develop or dispose of. Not to be confused with DCAM, but a like agency. Put them together so that you have, in one place, uh, a banker and a developer for the Commonwealth. Single point of service. It's worked very well. In this la in the last two years, this is $3 billion, that was the year before. In the last 24 months, the Mass Development has done over $4 billion worth of transactions. Over about 300 businesses, institutions, and cities and towns in the Commonwealth, very quietly um, and very effectively to try to help uh, the cities and towns in the Commonwealth, uh, both in terms of uh, business development as well as planning. Um, uh, we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to do that anymore. Let's, let's look at some of the cities. In terms of Worcester, Worcester said to itself, what Whoops, like a um, Worcester said to itself, as one of the major cities, what, what are we going to do? How do we take advantage of mass development? How do we take advantage of the state? How do we develop? Worcester is what's called a gateway city. It's the second largest city in New England. Not 
just in Massachusetts. Um, and oh, by the way, it's not far from Massachusetts for those of you who have visited Worcester. It's a wonderful place to see, to visit, and it's a very important part of the Commonwealth. But they were a brownfields environment. Their challenge in terms of urban development was what are we going to be in the 21st century? They focused on biotechnology. They used basically what had been developed in the 70s and 80s, that is, that is the, the, uh, the uh, UMass Medical Center in Worcester, and they said, we will in fact take old mills, use brownfields money that mass development will make available. Brownfields money is money that's made available to clean up polluted sites, generally mills in the cities and towns. So we'll use that. And then we will also take the intellectual capital from the university, and then we will also work to, to, to set up new businesses, incubate new businesses in most They have been incredibly successful. We help them a lot in, in doing that. They also capitalized on their other resource, which are colleges and universities, of which there are a healthy number there are at least seven majors and many other miners that are, that are located in the Worcester area. And, and with that, they also had one other secret to economic development in any good city and town, which is basically they had the city manager form of government. And if you look at, at Massachusetts as an example, and you go back to the 70s, when in fact Cambridge was one of the first, if not the first, to say we're going to have a city manager form of government. The, the major cities in Massachusetts that have made it, that are doing well, end up being those that have city managers. Lowell, Cambridge, Worcester. The ones that didn't do well, Springfield, New Bedford, Fall River, Pittsfield, of the large cities, said no, we're not going to have a city manager form. They therefore end up with two-year mayors and two-year city councils, and it is very difficult to get them. To get, uh, to get business done. So in terms of dealing with the urban development issue, and I'm going to cut this short because we only have 15 minutes, the issue of, of structure, first of all, political structure, so that there is in fact some basis upon which you can have reliability for zoning and permitting. In this commonwealth, and in most cities around the country, relies upon a city manager form of government. Okay? It really gets good if you have a four-year mayor also. So there is predictability. Cambridge becomes one of the greatest stories, not only in the United States, but in the world, in terms of the 19, how many people were in Cambridge in, 19, in the 1970s? Anybody here in the 70s? In the 1970s, in the 1970s, Cambridge had a mayor called Al Volucci. And, and it had an upcoming city council named Alice Wolf and Frank Duhay, who said, we're going to go after the good government. Okay? And they also had a leadership at MIT and at Harvard that said, there is a revolution coming our way in terms of science and technology and the ability to, in fact, transform basic research into businesses. We can't do it, however, if we can't get access to new zoning and new land in the city of Cambridge. Al Volucci, at that point in time, uh, they, they came forward and said, we therefore want to allow for the expansion and new zoning, mixed use and industrial zoning for East Cambridge. Al Volucci came forward in the famous comment, and I'll pave over Harvard Square. You can make it into a parking lot as well. He threatened. After, after much wrangling in the early 70s, it was agreed that, in fact, a new plan would come about. A city manager was hired, who, in fact, has been there to this day. There was one in the, the, the real city manager. has been there to this day. And you have seen the most extraordinary development in the shortest period of time providing the, one of the most creative centers of excellence for biotechnology in the world. And it occurred basically from 1975, 1977 through to today. Because all the pieces were in place. Good governance, the colleges and universities with the intellectual property, a focus on what the center of excellence would be. And then they used agencies of the state, which have come up to now be represented as mass development, to in fact provide necessary infrastructure funding, tax exempt funding, to provide them with it with the additional dollars that they needed before the market then took off. And now you've got a situation where in fact it is a market driven environment both for real estate and for development uh, and it's competitive around the world in terms of attracting new talent. Um, I have a bunch of other slides here which talk about New Bedford and the development of Bedford, Polio, Brockton, Fall River, Fitchburg, Haverhill, Lawrence, Lemonster, Lowell, Pittsfield, all of which are to simply say 
These are the successes based upon the factors that I've just given out in terms of, of what you have to look at, what we have to look at as a society and a community, if in fact we're going to have good urban development. If we continue along and believe that in fact Massachusetts becomes an example, that the current urban structures, the geopolitical structures, and the number of cities that are being represented to in fact have funding from the state uh, is viable, then we will in fact have budget cuts to serve, in the case of Massachusetts, 351 or so. I will leave you with the last point to think about and then turn the mic over. Um, I, I'm asked, I was asked by ranch, I'm asked by a number of people, you know, so, so how do you get people to think smaller than 351? Well, there is a notion, and this is an economic concept, this is not a, a uh, whatever you want to call it. It's called bribery. I say that because it will stick in your mind. Okay? It's, it, in an economics class, there's discussions on bribery, now, which is an incentive methodology. And right now, for those of you who, who work in the governments of cities and towns, you get a lot of money to build a school if you fill out the forms the right way. You get a lot of money to build a police station if you fill the forms the right way. Now, my suggestion is that we ought to try out that if you can bring together five contiguous cities and towns to agree on building less than five schools, you get 90% of the funding. If you only come together as four, you get 70% of the funding. If you come together as three, you get 50% of the funding. If you come together as two, you get 40. And you come together as one, and you get 30% of the funding. I would suggest that through basic fiscal tools, you have a very strong vehicle for incenting cities and towns to at least think differently. And oh, by the way, give them a court of appeal, give them vehicles for explaining why it doesn't work, and, and if we were only as creative in why things can work as why we argue why they don't work, we would, we would have a lot of miracles occurring. But think then, in terms of changing, about how you use economic and fiscal policy to incent people to do things that are more efficient and effective and do not substantially diminish services. Uh, I'll see you at questions.